Hello, Magic Community on YouTube. I'm T1 Glistener Elf, here with a couple of deck techs for you. This is the first in a two-part series on my takes on Polymorph. So let's start off with the eponymous card itself for this mono blue Polymorph deck tech. Polymorph itself. It's actually a little bit of a trickier card than a lot of people think. Destroy target creature. Yes, destroy. So your opponent can respond to it by destroying the targeted creature. Can be regenerated, but whatever. <laughs> You're not regenerating your own creature anyway. Its controller reveals cards from the top of their library until they reveal a creature card. The player puts the card onto the battlefield and shuffles all their cards revealed this way, yada yada yada. Alright, so what we care about is what comes next, and what does come next. Dun dun dun! Uh, the flying spaghetti monster itself, or Tentacruel, or Cthulhu, whatever. This is a big guy. This is the biggest thing that you can reasonably get. I would strongly submit to you. Um, well, actually, I think that's objectively the case. This is the biggest thing that you can get. You could get Draco, <laughs> I suppose, but you're not doing that. Um, so, it kind of just says yes. It has everything. No, it doesn't. Uh, very importantly, it doesn't have haste. That comes up a lot. If you want to play a blue or blue-red combo deck, Splinter Twin is good for a reason. Splinter Twin kills you on the turn that it combos off. We kill them one or two turns later. Importantly, we don't kill them on the turn that we combo off. So Imrakul doesn't quite do everything. That being said, if you untap with it, if you get to attack, you're probably in great shape. Now, it's the only creature in the deck. The only one without an asterisk behind it. That means that we can't run any other creatures because if we do, Polymorph will hit, potentially, in some cases, hit the other creature before Imrakul. This puts a huge deck building constraint on us. Uh, as much as I, I admire, I respect uh, Travis Wu, you know, so Channel Fireball, there's a, there's a video, there's a link right here. Uh, to his video series on a on an is it cheat Emrakul deck. It runs Polymorph, it runs Through the Breach, it runs the Storage Lands uh, to be able to cheat Emrakul out. And he's an awesome dude, and I strongly disagree with him uh, on his philosophy behind Polymorph, or maybe not philosophy, but one particular thing that he does. Uh, you'll notice when we get further on, we don't have Dryad Arbor. We cannot run the card. We, we can run Dryad Arbor. We can run four Misty Rainforest, maybe some more green fetches uh, to go and get the Dryad Arbor itself. But if you try to polymorph before getting the Dryad Arbor out, and you will have to in some cases, then depending on how many Emrakuls you have in the list, you have a 1 in X, where X is the number of Emrakuls plus 1, um, chance of hitting Dryad Arbor. So you polymorph away, say, a Mutavault and you hit Dryad Arbor. That's disappointing, that's depressing, that's not where you want to be. Uh, doing it this way, doing it his way, does make it potentially more consistent. You are, after all, using fetch lands to get it. So there's a chance you'll, there's a greater chance perhaps that you'll find it naturally. But that being said, if you fail to, you're in trouble. Uh, there are some other potential benefits. It allows you to polymorph through a Blood Moon, because Dried Arbor is still a creature. It maintains its super types like land and creature, and non-basic, um, through a Blood Moon. So, Dried Arbor isn't strictly worse than anything that I'm doing by any stretch of the imagination, don't get me wrong. Uh, that being said, it's not necessarily where you want to be, I would submit. I, I would submit. Now, on to everything else. So how do we then? Uh, Emrakul is the only creature in our deck that doesn't have an asterisk behind it. And what I mean by that is, everything else becomes a creature, but isn't a creature while it's in your library, while it's in your deck. For instance, Ink Moth Nexus. I wouldn't be T1 Glistener Elf if I didn't have Infect in here somewhere. <laughs> I very much admire this card. I Obviously it's not underrated. There's a reason why it's, what, like 20 bucks now? Jeez. Oh, good grief. Uh, this card is very powerful. 
Uh, it's a strong enabler, however, it's, it makes Polymorph go off on turn 5 instead of turn 4 like a Dryad Arbor would. Don't worry, we have other ways to go off on turn 4, um, but it flies, it has Infect, it allows you to go on a fair axis, whereas a deck like his does not have a good backup plan, because it doesn't really have a backup plan. Um, you, you combo off in his, and that's fine, but we want to be able to do something else, and we'll get to that in just a moment, I safely assure you. Uh, so, for Ink Moth Next Eye, next we have three cloud forms. There's an article that I read, it's in the description, you can check it out by going to the doobly-doo, I think what they call it. Um, an article that I read about cloud form being used in polymorph decks, and I was inspired. I, I'm not the kind of person to try to net deck, I, but I, I, you can't agree with something that just is that right, right? <laughs> right. So, cloud form. Manifest the top card, this becomes an aura, and it has the manifest has flying and hexproof. Hexproof, that is critical. As far as I'm aware, and I could be wrong, correct me in the comments if I am wrong, but even now, uh, this is the only card, the only, let's say, non-creature creature in modern that gives itself hexproof. Without the use of any additional cards, it has hexproof. That's important because, remember, Polymorph destroys target creature, and if they can destroy it in response, say, a lightning bolt or something, then you do not go off. They have disrupted your combo. And smarter players, or players who have played against this before, uh, will know this, especially experienced players, because, again, Polymorph is not a new strategy. It's been around in some form or another uh, for some time. Um, now, <laughs> moving on. Vidalkin Shackles, because even if they do destroy the creature, you took one of theirs. They're destroying their creature. This, again, allows you to go off on a fair plan, and actually, Tassiger made this card so much better for our list. Take their Tassiger, get some card advantage out of it. That's, uh, that's pretty insane when it does happen to go off. Now, that being said, it puts another restriction on our deck. Vidalkin Shackles uh, counts the number of islands that you control. So we need to run a lot of islands. Sorry, Inkmoth Nexus, you are not one. That's fine, though. The way that I run this list, Inkmoth is the only non-island. Feel more than free to disagree, and I'll actually run through some alternatives in just a moment. Uh, but Vidalkin Shackles wants you to play a lot of islands, so we do. And do. And do. Uh, lastly, for the creatures, we have... I said creatures, asterisk creatures, we have Batterskull. Uh, another I will beat you on the fair plan card. This one allows us, I think, to have a strong game against uh, control decks that go on for longer, and most, es I, I say most especially, it gives us something to do in the main board against burn. Uh, if we can make it to turn six, if we can untap with Batterskull and swing in, We've probably won that game, and frankly, Burn is a bad matchup for us, so we want to do anything that we can. Um, plus, there's always the occasional pleasure that you might get every now and then of equipping a Batter Skull to an Ink Moth Nexus and swinging in for the win. Maybe I'm just the only one that likes that, but <laughs> I really like that. Oh dear. It's only a one of. It's actually rather expensive, obviously. Uh, but if they can deal with it without a counterspell, if they deal with it when it's on the battlefield, that's okay. Just bounce it back to your hand and try again. Now, when I say that we have a fair plan, we have a backup plan, this is what I'm talking about. One reason why I think that this deck hasn't really flourished, hasn't thrived, is because many times that it's played, it is just the combo. It is just polymorph into Emrakul, done. Even when it has a control element to it, even when it's running a lot of counter spells, that isn't necessarily enough. There are a lot of good sideboard cards that will just wreck the deck, if that's all that you're doing. Uh, even mainboard cards. So if they side in Graft Digger's Cage, you're in trouble. If they have Spell Sky, you're in trouble. If they have Liliana of the Veil, because you have to actually attack, um, because you actually have to, well, untap with it, it doesn't have haste. Liliana can just edict you, and you have to polymorph again. And hope that Liliana isn't at two or greater, because then she'll do it again, and so on and so forth. So you need a backup plan, I would submit, in order to be competitive, and Rune Chanter's Pike is the way to go. 
I would submit. It's one way. You can try other swords, for instance. Um, and Rune Chander's Pike isn't necessarily the best one because there's a little bit of a nombo with Emrakul. If for whatever reason you have to discard Emrakul, it will make the Rune Chander's Pike less awesome. That being said, you can one-shot people out of nowhere when you put this on an Ink Moth Nexus in the late game. Just cast Rune Chander's Pike. If it resolves, equip it, swing, and if you're late enough in the game, you might actually have enough spells and or instants and sorceries anyway to do the job. If not one shot, two shot, um, three shot with cloud form, it's a very powerful card. It's a two of. In previous list, I have run it. I believe either as a four or a one. I'm not even sure exactly how many is the right number or if that can even be objectively determined. Uh, but it depends, I would submit, on how many uh, instants and sorceries you're running. And for this build, we run a fair number, so I would say that we want to do that. We want to keep it in. Uh, next, I have four Gitaxian probes. I'm cantrip heavy enough, I would submit, because firstly, we want in, in this particular case, we want to have information. We want to know whether we can go off or not. Um, so you can also try peak, for instance, if you want that information and you can't afford... I think a taxing probe is now more expensive. It's uh, surprising me. Uh, certainly the promo is, is not cheap. Uh, I got these a while ago. Uh, but also, since we're a combo deck, we are looking for the combo pieces. And so, a taxing probe. It fulfills both of those roles. And I think that it does so rather well. Oh, Serum Visions. Why you no get reprint? Oh dear. Um, <laughs> Sleight of Hand is a good alternative. Again, Peak isn't necessarily a bad card uh, because it gives you the information as well. Uh, but honestly, it's hard to argue with how much reach this card gives you. Drawing a card to find an answer right then and then scrying a little bit to put away the cards you don't need, it's hard to argue with, but I, I would not say that just because you can't afford Serum Visions means you should not run this deck. There are al there are alternatives, and you can build the deck and then work towards these and wait for a reprint. Or pick some up during FNM season this coming month. Uh, this, I think, is a, a neat little innovation to the deck. I have four Anticipates. Why would I do something? And there's, there's another card. <laughs> I have four Anticipates. I like the ability to hold up mana for counter spells, and then if you happen not to need it that turn, do a little bit of digging, uh, find an answer. That's why I like Anticipate in this slot. Now, it's no impulse, certainly not, uh, but it gives you enough reach, and importantly, it's an instant. That's what I like most about it, because... Dun 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 dun! I run counter spells. This is Mana Leak, just in case you can't tell it's in French after all. Um, but yeah, just the ability to counter spell in the early game, occasionally it'll come up in the later game. That's always nice. I mean, what is there? It sort of speaks for itself, the card. Um, Remand. Since you're a tempo deck to a certain extent, um, you can play the tempo game, I should say. It's rather like Splinter Twin. You can play the tempo game, and you're looking for a combo. And this helps you with both of those. Although, if they're going for destroying your creature, a lot of their removal is fairly cheap, actually. And so a remand might not be enough. They'll just return it in hand and then cast it again. I'm thinking Lightning Bolt. I'm thinking uh, Path to Exile. That sort of cheap removal uh, might actually get you there. Also, this is my favorite art, for whatever reason. I don't know. Feel free to disagree. Maybe it's the long hair. I, I like that. I have it after all. Okay, so now we're getting into some, into some flex slots. Uh, these are the ones that I am least sure about having. Uh, or at least these numbers. But maybe the card itself. I do like Force of Will. <laughs> I, I like playing against my opponent, and when I cast Disrupting Shell, saying Force of Will pitching X, and sometimes my opponent gets it and snickers or whatever, sometimes they have to read the card, or in one case, you can't play Force of, oh, I think that was actually how he said it, you can't play Force of. Um, 
Yeah, so a lot of decks, a surprising number of decks, uh, if you counter a single spell, then they're done. Uh, not done, period, but it greatly disrupts their momentum. I'm thinking, for instance, uh, Boggles, I think, is the biggest example, or Hexproof, or whatever you want to call it. Because there isn't really any good turn one counter magic to stop creatures that cost one in modern, there's no force of will, you can't spell snare it, you can't spell pierce it, you can't swan song it, so on and so forth. Those decks just take it for granted that they can resolve a turn one uh, boggle. And as such, they're willing to keep hands with just one creature. And if you can counter that, that hand that looked so good, it looks so sexy, that hand is done. That uh, hand, is, they're just going to have to wait until they find something else. And in a deck like that that doesn't run many, they could just very well be over and done with. So another example is my, my Precious Infect. If you stop their Glistener Elf, and that was the only creature they had, in a deck that frankly doesn't run that many creatures generally, they might have to be digging for a while. Um, another example might be, to a lesser extent, Burn where they're expecting that turn one goblin guide or that monastery swift spear to go and hit and hit and hit and hit over and over again and if you don't let them do that uh, then that's a lot of damage that's taken off All right. dissolve again I'm not saying that this is necessarily right it is after all cancel it does say scry one that helps us to find our combo a little bit more easily um, I just appreciate that it is a hard counter. We can't run Familiar's Ruse because we don't have enough creatures. We can't really run Deprive because it puts us back a land, and that could be very important for us going off on time. So given that, we run Dissolve, or at least I'm running Dissolve. And I'll, I'll run over some, uh, some alternatives for you in just a moment. And you be the judge of whether or not they're good, they're, whether or not they're all right bit more room. I want to fit them all on this one row if I can help it. And then lastly in this, I have the card Repeal. Just as a one of, in the main board I want to be able to find something that can get rid of a problem permanent that some decks will run. Uh, so for example, if I'm looking at Ensnaring Mill, the, the card Ensnaring Bridge keeps us from going off. I want to be able to dig for an answer in the main board if I can't counter it on the way down. Uh, it also draws us a card, so it's a little bit of tempo. Uh, it's just in there because occasionally I might need it, and I think that the odds of that happening are strong enough that it merits an inclusion of one. Um, and uh, also it helps a little bit against... Burn is frankly a bad match for us. Uh, I like being able to after the Goblin Guide has given us some information, maybe given us a card, to bounce and put them back just a little bit, not much. Um, but let us find our combo a little bit more easily. Now, <laughs> here we go. Now onto the good stuff. Islands! Oh, so beautiful. Okay, so I, for whatever reason, am 13 years old. That art. Yeah, I'm, I'm 13. So, I only have, however, uh, 13 of these wonderful little... Oh, was it 13 or 14? How many do I have? Oh, okay, wait. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I have 14. Alright, so never mind. Never mind. Uh, of this particular island. I'm running 23 lands in the deck. Uh, so, 4 plus 14... It means I have 5 more to go. <laughs> I'm just messing with you all. Alright, so because I don't have enough of these, uh, you can run, like, this is my favorite art that isn't that one because it's so colorful. Uh, you can run some snow-covered islands to maybe throw them off. Think that you're running something else. Maybe have some scrying sheets in. Uh, if you're old school, you can try the Easter Island one. You can try some foreign cards. This one's a Japanese island from Theros. And you can just try a regular old one that... Uh, I am not sponsored by anybody, actually, but uh, they sent me, Card CC sent me uh, an island that said, Thanks, Jay! I actually put my name on it. Oh, so they're good guys, so I'm okay with giving them a little bit of... Uh, they're shouting them out. Shouting out. Alright, 
but we want we want this island on the front because again I am 13. No, I'm not. I'm like twice that. And uh, now onto the sideboard. <laughs> Very much in flux. I am not terribly sure about several of these actually. And in fact, when we get to the very end, you'll see uh, the last two slots. I don't know which I would run if I were to go to a tournament right now. Uh, we're going to start off with Aetherize. It's an anti-mid-range card. Uh, just be able to bounce a bunch of stuff back to their hand. Uh, we get a little bit more value out of it nowadays thanks to all the Delve cards, especially Tasker and Gurmog Angler, that are hanging out. When I say value, I mean effectively it's like setting them back uh, on quite a bit of mana potentially, because since they're losing cards in their graveyard, it makes it harder just to recast them right after that. Alright. Next one I have is Basiju Who Shelters All. This is for the counterspell matches, so that they can't counter your poly polymorph. If they can't counter it and they can't destroy the creature, see cloud form here, then they can't do anything about it. <laughs> and you're and you're quite alright with just winning with just winning. Uh, what can they do at that point? Maybe tap Emrakul down with Cryptic Command, but that's just stalling. That doesn't get them there. Uh, burn is bad enough that we have two Dispels. I, I, you could run more. You can actually run uh, Sun Droplet in there as well. Nice little colorless answer to it. Um, I don't think you can run something like Dragon's Claw because you aren't running any red yourself and you're relying wholly on them to fuel you there. I think that you actually just, when you're not running red, do better by having Sun Droplet. And Sun Droplet, in case you don't happen to know what that card is, let me show you. It's this one. And then it's on the screen as well, on the right side. Alright. Now, Echoing Truth is next. Deal with problem permanents that keep us from going off. Uh, including multiples of them, like multiple spell skites, multiple graph diggers cages, uh, for instance. Um, helps with tokens, to be sure. Soul sisters, potentially, that sort of thing. Affinity. <laughs> so we have two Hercules recalls. Uh, Jared, your uh, channel is now in my description. Uh, be sure to check it out, because this guy let me borrow one of them. And the other was uh, given to me, lended to me, <laughs> lent to me, by a friend named Andrew, who, as far as I'm aware, does not have a YouTube channel, so I can't really help him out on that. But he's also an awesome dude. He brews decks like I do. Well, he brews decks as well. I don't know if he does it like I do. Um, but he's tried out some crazy cool ideas. If, you, uh, if you've seen the Casca Balance videos on my channel, he's the pilot of them. Casca Balance in Legacy. Oh, fun. Uh, now... This one can go mainboard. I would certainly think that you can, for instance, in the repeal slot. Uh, Jace, Architect of Thought, is actually another potential win conditions for the deck, because his ult gets you an Emrakul, cast the Emrakul so you get the extra turn, and then cast something from your opponent's deck as well. That's not bad. He's four mana, though. I'm not sure that he's worthy of being in the mainboard, is the trick. Um, however, I have one time countered Splinter Twin by disrupting Shoal, pitching Jace Architect of Thought. That was a, that was a silly game <laughs> when we got to that point. Uh, but yes, it also helps you to fight tokens, it helps you to fight Soul Sisters, helps you to fight Burn a little teeny tiny bit, just a, just a bit, potentially. Um, taking one of their Burn spells, for instance, or making their creatures a little bit weaker. Um, that's not much, though. That's, that's not really in there for the... Uh, it also helps you against control. You can just keep using Factor Fiction, baby Factor Fiction, um, or, depending on the match, you might actually just try to go up and ult cast the Emrakul. That might be where you want to be. Now, we do have Pything Needle in here. Uh, this one is for Spellskite. This one's for Liliana of the Veil. Vale. This one is also for, occasionally you'll find a deck where Pything Needle just wrecks them. The first one that I think of off the top of my head is Ad Nauseam. Because weirdly, and I know this doesn't work with all Ad Nauseam decks because not all of them are running Lightning Storm as a win condition, but many of them are because Lightning Storm lets them go off at instant speed. Um, Lightning Storm has an activated ability, which is weird for an instant. That, that card is just weird. 
um, pything needle actually will stop that. And so they have to deal with it. And that's not to say that they can't, but it puts up a barrier for them. Uh, next we have Ratchet Bomb. Again, deal with problem permanence, deal with tokens, deal with decks that keep their mana cost for permanence on the field at about the same number. I'm thinking Burn, Soul Sisters. Why am I on about Soul Sisters so much? We do actually have a Soul Sisters player over at uh, Dragon Star Hobbies. Uh, at least one. And therefore I have to be prepared for it. Your meta may differ. Now, because Splinter Twin is a thing, uh, so similarly to Disrupting Shoals, aka Force of Will, where if you can catch them, uh, you're tapped out, they think that the coast is clear and they get a little reckless. Uh, similarly to that, where you can just get them off a Disrupting Shoal, Snapback will do the same thing occasionally. So they only have enough mana to go off with, um, with Splinter Twin itself. They don't have enough for counter magic, so they go off and you snap back. It's a one for one or a two for one if you're tapped out and you have to do it that way because they're still getting back the creature, but you just hit their splinter twin and without the card itself, they're a, a mediocre tempo deck. You might be able to beat them just by them not being able to kill you before you combo off. Alright. Lastly, for the cards that I am that I have in sleeves, because I'm sure enough of them, is Spreading Seas. Why not Ghost Quarter? This is, after all, for fighting Tron. And you can try Ghost Quarter if you want, by all means. The reason I don't use Ghost Quarter is because the land itself would set us back a turn. We're losing a land, they're keeping the same number, and we need four lands at least to go off, because Polymorph is, after all, a four drop. Spreading Seas will still remove the land, will draw us a card, and doesn't let us go back uh, a turn, potentially. Uh, however, however, it's not strictly better. Uh, Ghost Quarter, after all, does hit Scape Shift. So, while the triggers are on the stack, um, you can knock out one of their lands with Ghost Quarter, and it's not enough sometimes to kill them. Uh, however, if you have a Ghost Quarter already out, they're playing around that anyway. They know that they need to wait just a bit longer, uh, they'll wait another turn or two, find another land, and scape shift when they have more than enough anyway. So, Ghost Quarter d does help against scape shift a bit, a bit, but Spreading Seas is also a little bit of tempo, finds us the combo a little more easily. So, that's why I have that there. Now, only 13 cards. We have two more to go. And I have uh, two pairs of cards. Now, let me, before I show them to you, let me give you a, um, a theory of mine. So, as I said earlier that one reason why this deck hasn't done very well, why it hasn't been very competitive and modern, is because it doesn't really have a good backup plan. Now, anyone that's played Splinter Twin knows you don't have to win off of the combo. Indeed, you might even, depending on the match or the opponent, you might even side out the combo. If they're citing in p disruption, if they're citing in pieces that can wreck your combo, first thing I think of off the top of my head is Illness in the Ranks, and then you've got Torpor Orb, which is going to hit you anyway. Um, you have Knight of Souls Betrayal, uh, which doesn't see a lot of play. When you have cards like those that come in to hit the combo itself, well, what do you do? You side out the combo and become a more streamlined tempo deck. So they have dead cards and you don't. That's the idea anyway. What I've been experimenting with, and it hasn't always worked, is siding out the combo, siding out the four polymorphs and the two emeracles, and instead becoming a tempo deck. So they side in their graft diggers cage, they side in more spell skites, and we don't care. I mean we do potentially. Those cards can still possibly do something against us. Graft diggers cage will still stop Cloud form from manifesting. Spell sky will still direct. Uh, repeal. <laughs> I guess that's about it, actually. Um, but the, you want to have a deck that doesn't, that that at least in some to some extent invalidates those cards. That's my theory. And to that end, I have two more rune changers pikes, or two more corrupt or two corrupted consciences. Now. Why which? Why one? Why the other? Well, Rune Chanter's Pike is definitely the more efficient card. Uh, if we're citing out Emrakul, we now no longer have to worry about accidentally shuffling our library or graveyard back into our library, 
and so our creatures will generally just get bigger. Uh, it gives us a little bit more redundancy on this particular plan. However, if the opponent is smart, if they realize what you're doing, they're actually probably already citing in a good bit of artifact hate. Uh, one reason that Ink Moth Nexus isn't necessarily the greatest card is they're already citing in, even if they didn't happen to know that it's an artifact at the time. They're already citing it in to fight Vidalkin Shackles, to fight Batterskull, to fight your Rune Chanders Pikes. Um, you can try, say, for instance, um, and I should have mentioned this earlier, uh, but if you don't want to have all islands because you don't have Vidalkin Shackles, or if you want to have something to replace Ink Moth because it dies to Ancient Grudge, for instance, uh, then you might want to try a f some of a few other cards. I have Fairy Conclave as a potential replacement for Ink Moth Nexus. Um, it does require a little bit more mana to become a creature, but it doesn't tap in the process. Now that's not necessarily terribly relevant, but uh, it, it slows you down on comboing off, but it isn't an artifact, and so spot removal, like Ancient Grudge, won't deal with that. Halimar Depths as a way to index for three yourself, you're still getting the land out of it, and you might find the combo or an answer a little bit more quickly. Add some fetch lands in as well, and you can get a little bit more value out of this. And lastly, Oboro Palace in the Clouds. This one's actually worth something, I'm not going to throw it. <laughs> um, this one is probably the least necessary out of them. You have to ask yourself, I think, why Tron runs it as a one of, or, or so, one or so. And that's because they actually use it to filter. They're filtering colorless mana into blue mana, and that occasionally might matter because you have Ink Moth Nexus after all. Um, so let's say that you have uh, two Ink Moth Nexi and an Obora, and you have Cloudform in your hand. You need blue blue to manifest it, but you only have one blue on the field. So you tap Obora for blue, tap an Ink Moth to return it to hand, play it again, tap it for blue, and then tap the other Ink Moth. That's pretty much the one case where that actually matters. It doesn't even matter for Dissolve, because you can't do that trick on your opponent's turn. Uh, it might matter. Your opponent might try to do something in your turn. Um, but you sh And if they do, they're probably doing it at the end of turn anyway, so it probably doesn't actually matter. Um, so it's, it's a very marginal benefit that you're getting out of it. But, again, it might mean something. Uh, now that being said, uh, Rune Changer's Pike is an artifact, of course. So when they cite in their artifact removal, they can hit Rune Changer's Pike. They can hit a lot of what we're doing. Uh, so if you want to try something that gets around artifact removal, my recommendation then is Corrupted Conscience. I have taken control of Worm Coral Engines. Unfortunately, I wish that game got on on camera. Well. Well, granted, we had two of the three games in that match on camera, but I didn't upload it because we didn't get the third, because I didn't hit the record button before game three started, so I apologize for that. But this card plays against bigger decks, say, decks with Tassiger, Gurmog Angler, Worm Coil Engine. This deck plays, or this card plays against those decks because you know you're going to get to the late game, and you can just take control of one of theirs, and their artifact removal won't actually do very much. Not at all, potentially. Um, so, once you take control of a tasker, start getting value out of it. Um, just, once you have, let's see, that gives us 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 creatures in the deck, and the opponent will probably not see this card coming. Uh, so that's another recommendation that I have. Choose whichever one you like. Uh, feel free to disagree. I very much like it. Uh, I've tried it before. I think that it's probably better than just having two more Rune Chanters Pikes. Um, especially because Rune Chanters Pike can be a little bit redundant with itself. First strike, doesn't it doesn't matter how many instances you have of it. And also, with your Ink Moth Nexus, you're already spending two mana a turn to equip it, plus the one to make it a creature, and then you tap Ink Moth. You're already putting yourself down potentially four mana for later. Um, with Corrupted Conscience, five and you're done. Uh, no more investment necessary. Uh, now, the reason I have Corrupted Conscience instead of, say, Control Magic is because the infect actually matters because we're playing Ink Moth Nexus and we might have already dealt them some incidental infect damage over the course of the game. It happens. 
<laughs> Alright, so there's the deck for you in its first form. This is mono blue. And now, uh, there's actually a little video here if you want to skip to part two for the Is It Polymorph deck. In the meantime, I'm going to have a little bit of tea. I'm not... I'm from the south, but it's not that kind of tea. I'm weird like that. I like hot tea. Uh, give me just a moment, and I will see you on the other side. Take care. Also, is it just me, or did anyone else happen to notice that the bunny rabbit thing that's turning into a wilted tree in this art kind of looks like this guy from Spell Pierce? Was I the only one to notice that? I mean, it probably doesn't mean anything, but, you know, it's just... Wait a minute. It's half a bunny, and half this thing, and you're the whole thing, and polymorph and spell pierce, that's three words, and there's a three in the mana cost of the one that's half the- Halfway three confirmed! <laughs>